so if you uh, so I'm going to give you one more problem and this is going to be a relatively difficult problem okay, you you will probably not get uh, a more difficult problem in your exam so this is sort of the upper limit of the level of difficulty that uh, uh, you can expect uh, actually you can expect if you, so depending on whether or not you're able to answer this problem uh, we'll see you know uh, we'll we'll think over the level of difficulty that we should uh, uh, the level of difficulty of the questions that we need to prepare so uh, as you recall from chapter 2 we had the indexing pipeline where we had we first gathered the documents that had to be indexed then we passed the documents successively through a tokenization module and a linguistic pre-processing module and finally the indexer took the stream of normalized tokens which were output by the linguistic pre-processing module and then built an index out of it. Now in that particular chapter, in chapter 2, I mentioned that this entire pipeline, especially the tokenization and linguistic pre-processing phases are language dependent, are highly language dependent. So clearly if you have a search engine that is serving documents in different languages there will be separate pipelines for each language so when a document comes in okay, let's say you crawl a particular document from the web you have to figure out what language the document is in in order to send it to the right pipeline so right at the beginning itself at the stage where you decide which pipeline, which indexing pipeline to send the document in, you have to first detect the language of the document. So here's a uh, here is a classification problem. Okay, I I think we also saw in chapter two that this language detection problem can be looked at as a classification problem. Now that we have done the section on classification, let's try to think about how we would actually classify a document into one of the languages. Okay, and for simplification, let's assume that there are only two languages, English and French, at least for this search engine. Uh, so, here is some data for you. If you look at the 10 most frequent biograms in both the languages, English and French, these are the 10 most frequent biograms. So how is a biogram generated? You may recall from your chapter 3, when you have a word, say it has three characters X, Y, Z, what are the biograms that will be generated from it? So, so the dollar x, x, y, y, z, and z dollar. Yeah. So these are the four biograms. Now, so imagine having training data. Imagine having training data of English documents, okay, and French documents. So what would you do in your training uh, data? You would parse your English documents. So these documents have been labeled as being in the language English. So you would, so let's say you take every word in every document, every English document, and you split it into biograms. And you keep track of what are the top 10 biograms that you see across all English documents. So this is what you would find. 
you may find that these are the top 10 biograms. So uh, initially you will obviously look at term frequencies in order to figure out which are the top 10 biograms. You will keep track of the term frequencies of each biogram. Okay, when I say term frequencies, it's a little misleading because we are not keeping track of frequencies of terms. But uh, you can think of them as uh, biogram frequencies maybe. So the number of times each biogram appears in the English class. Okay. And let's say you pick the top 10. You, pick, you, you focus just on the top 10 uh, most frequent biograms. Okay, and you create a vector of size 10 corresponding to those 10 biograms. And you normalize the vector. So this is, this is, these are the components of that vector that you would see. Okay, and these have been, I mean, these are given in decreasing order of uh, component values, but it doesn't matter what order they are in. This is 0.468, this is 0.441, and so on. You could do the same thing for French documents find out which are the top 10 biograms, most frequently occurring biograms in French documents and then create a vector and normalize it. Now in the test phase, you get these two documents. And you can see from visual inspection that the first one is an English document, the second one is a French document. So here's my question. How would you classify these two documents? So, um, like, like as I do in the previous uh, question, uh, mm. like again for the test document, we could split that into uh, biograms, sir. Okay. And uh, you, so make a, a vector for that. And that could probably be like a... Uh, so binary vector like one or, or so like a count vector so uh, okay. for example dollar t is there at the start of a word so maybe you could have that as just once but he is there twice so okay. uh, so so like this you could make one vector uh, for each for both the documents and mm -hmm. uh, we could multiply those vectors with the top 10 english and the top 10 french so we'll have four results so, like, uh, so for D1, when we multiply with English and multiply with French, whichever one is greater, we'll classify it in that class and same for D2, sir. Okay, yeah, that's, that's right. So, again, the overall approach, so basically what you're doing is you're checking whether the count vector of D1 is closer to the English vector or to the French vectors. Now, both of these are unit vectors, so you may want to normalize your count vectors beforehand or while computing your cosine scores you may take the dot product and then divide it by the magnitude of the count vectors. So let's let's actually determine the vector for D1. Okay so the biograms you would see are dollar T, TH, HE, ER, R E E dollar dollar H H E E dollar dollar G G O O E E S and S dollar. So, if we had to create a count vector, it would look something like this. So, let's say the first position is for dollar $t. How many times does dollar $t appear? Once. How many times does th appear? Once. How many times does he appear? Two times. Then let's say the next position is for ER. How many times does ER appear? Once. RE. Once. 
ई डॉलर प्राइस डॉलर एच वंस ओके एच ई इज समथिंग वी हैव ऑलरेडी कंसिडर्ड ई डॉलर इज ऑल्सो समथिंग वी हैव ऑलरेडी कंसिडर्ड लेट्स लुक एट डॉलर जी डॉलर जी अपियर्स वंस देन यू हैव जी ओ वंस ओ ई E S is okay. We haven't seen E S, so E S is once, and S dollar is also once. Okay, so I'm just keeping track of which uh, which biograms each of these components corresponds to over here, because the order may be different for the other vectors. so this is the count vector and you may want to normalize this count vector what do you do to normalize this vector so, um, so i'll divide each of them uh, by the sum of the squares that the, of the count so like of the total yeah. Uh, yeah so that would be the sum of the squares of you know 1 square plus 1 square plus 2 squared Plus one squared and so on. Okay, I don't think I need to calculate this. Whatever that is, you'll divide each of the components by that particular value, and you'll get a normalized uh, count vector. So you can think of this like the TF-IDF score, where the IDF is given to be one for all uh, terms, and the term frequency is just the raw term frequency, just like the first problem we saw and uh, then what you would do is to take the dot product you, so you want to see whether the representative vector for the english class okay which is uh, so this is not exactly rokio but the intuition is that we want to find out the class that is closer to this document and to do that we find the cosine similarity between this document vector and these two vectors whichever has the highest cosine higher cosine similarity that will be the class of the d1 so actually if you do the calculations you will find that d1 has a higher cosine similarity with the english vector and d2 has a higher cosine similarity with the french vector so this is how you can classify each document into the corresponding languages this is one of the ways you can do that any questions so what i'm doing here is i'm going back to something i mentioned earlier but looking at it through the lens of what we've done later so we've done classification recently so i'm going back and explaining to you and you know ideally in your exams the kind of questions that um, i would say good exams have is not to directly ask you to repeat whatever you've done in class but to extend it and apply it to slightly different examples so that you know you can connect different chapters together so this is an example of a problem which sort of crosses chapter boundaries